Hi, I'm Bruno Aziza, and this week I'm in New Haven, Connecticut. And behind me in this house lives one of the busiest people in the business analytics industry. His name is Ian Ayers. He's the author of 11 books, one of them New York Times bestseller, Super Crunchers. Ian is a lawyer, a professor at Yale, an economist, and his work's been featured on Oprah as well as Good Morning America, to name a few. He also writes for Forbes magazine and is featured on the Freakonomics blog. Ian was kind enough to invite us into his home to talk about number crunching, incentives, and even diet. In this first feature, we talk about how simple statistical analysis can be more accurate than humans. Come with me. He can predict the quality of a Bordeaux before anyone has even tasted it. Predict their lifespan or their probability of divorcing. So Ian, thank you very much for welcoming us into your home. Uh, lots of people in our audience uh, admire your work and, and you're particularly known for your work in super crunchers. This idea that math sometimes can be better than what mm -hmm. humans can predict. Can you tell us a little bit about the principle behind super crunchers? Right. The, the central idea is that any substantial organization that's not both using regressions and randomization is presumptively screwing up. And so let's pick an example here. We're, we're drinking a great Bordeaux. And in your book, you talk about how uh, people in the wine industry might be using some of these principles. Can you take us through the example? Sure. I, uh, uh, <clears throat> Orly Ashenfelter is an excellent, a world-class number cruncher, and he also loves wine. And he's developed this regression, this algorithm that uses centrally about four variables having to do with rainfall and uh, growing temperature. And he can predict the quality of a Bordeaux before anyone has even tasted it, when it's still in the barrel and, uh, and still aging. So, well, his formula basically is allowing me to know the quality of the wine even before I open the bottle. That's right. So, clearly, when you're presenting such a theory, uh, the industry might react di a little differently to that. Can you tell <laughs> us about how people thought about it? And here, I'm, for our audience, I'm thinking about bringing data into an audience that thinks they're very experienced with a particular business. Well, this is an example of the, the iron law of resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Parker, who's one of the great handicappers of Bordeaux, he was not amused when Orly started doing uh, his first predictions and said some intemperate things. But, you know, uh, Orly's predictions year after year were more accurate than some of Parker's. And... Um, uh, and, uh, in fact, the Wine Spectator criticized Orly because half of his predictions were too high and half of them were too low. But that's a good idea. That, that, that means that you have an unbiased prediction. And the, the little secret is that, uh, uh, that Parker has been making better predictions. Uh, it seems like he's taking better account of these uh, uh, temperature and rainfall variables. So at first you should expect resistance, but then over time there is the ability for you to actually impact human behavior towards mm -hmm. data. Um, what happens next, and, and more importantly for our audience, what are the factors that determine where data and models like that are better, or indeed better than, than human judgment? You need to have uh, a sufficient amount of data before you can uh, uh, use these number crunching tools. And, and you have to have comparables. Uh, and what works well with wine is that you orally had data on lots of different uh, vineyards for a lot of different years. And that was, uh, but if, if you have a one-off decision that, mm -hmm. gosh, I, I want to put 10,000 servers in western Kansas, and nobody's ever done that before, it's going to be very hard to run to crunch numbers to find out whether that building that plant is a good thing. Or we want to have a a uh, launch a, a, a rocket to Mars, and we just haven't done that before. I, you need comparables in order to do that, and, and so that's your, going to be your first place to, to look. So this is the idea that history matter, and to what level does history matter? Now, there are orga organizations using very similar models, I think, about Netflix. I think about Pandora as a way to suggest to me songs that I'm going to be likely to like. Uh, in your book, you talk about the example of eHarmony. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the lessons there? Well, eHarmony is a great super crunching uh, firm. They have uh, run regressions on compatibility regressions, trying to predict 
uh, how much two people will like each other based on thousands of surveys, uh, personality surveys of different couples. And, and these are people that have never met before. Well, they, uh, they start with people that are in uh, relationships, and they use them as the background, mm-hmm. but it's a lot like the Bordeaux, just like Orly made predictions about people who, uh, about wines that no one had tasted, they'll make predictions about the compatibility of couples that have never seen each other before. And it's a very different kind of a dating service. Traditionally, a dating service would ask you, who do you want to go out with? Then they'd match you with those types of people. eHarmony, they give you a personality test, and they may end up matching you with people that you didn't think you would have liked to go out with, and, but you do. This is interesting where data basically can guide you into a direction that you might not have anticipated. And the same thing uh, works uh, with, with music, uh, that if you, I put in uh, to uh, uh, Rhapsody mm-hmm. uh, that I like Bruce Springsteen, and they come back with uh, a, a song from uh, uh, the Idaho that I never have heard before, but I like. Mm-hmm. And there are many uh, other music systems that do that. I think the lesson for organizations sometimes is to let the analytics guide the employees into areas that intuitively they might not have ex- uh, experienced or thought of. When I think about your work, I also think about uh, areas where people might think it's, there's opposing work, like the work of Malcolm Gladwell and this idea that sometimes intuition guides uh, the right decisions. And sometimes you can be qualified as an expert without really having the ability to explain why you're an expert. Do you have a point of view on that? Sure. Well, you know, Gladwell, he's actually more nuanced on this. You know, he talks in Blink about the, the value of intuitive uh, uh, momentary decisions, but he also talks about when they can go haywire. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and indeed, that shielding yourself from certain types of, of information has allowed orchestras to uh, make uh, better decisions. Uh, literally behind a screen, they don't discriminate as much on the basis of gender. Uh, or he has, Gladwell has this really great article in the New Yorker, you can look it up online, about epigogics. And again, it's like eHarmony, or th- we keep coming back to the Bordeaux's, epigogics will make a prediction of how successful a film will be before a single frame is shot. How do they do that? Uh, well, they start by having uh, coding up 200 variables on thousands of past movies, where they know how how many uh, how much box off uh, box office sales those movies have had, and then they code uh, up the script and the associated information on a film that has been greenlit but which has not yet gone into production. And for example, on the Interpreter, they predicted that the script just by looking at the script that it would sell forty five million dollars domestic, and they were. I think $2 million off. They oh were goodness. incredibly uh, close, and they had the double audacity to make uh, to suggest changes to the script. They said that if they had added on a, a sidekick for the Nicole Kidman character and focused more on New York City as the location, that they might have added $12 million to it. And they found insights that we, you would have not anticipated before, like the importance of the location rather than the importance of a particular actor as well. That's right. It turns out location, 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 in both real estate and in movies. That uh, uh, It turns out audiences get confused if there are too many places. They don't like that as much. They uh, And they uh, a lot of the $20 million... Uh, price tags uh, that the stars carry with them just aren't borne out in bringing uh, people into the seats. So uh, there seems to be two lessons here for our audience. I think the first one is this idea that there's going to be situations where math is going to matter more than human judgment, but you have some certain factors that you need to follow. For instance, history needs to matter. Yes. And there's some cases where you have to be flexible, uh, maybe as a CIO or maybe uh, an executive, in leading people into directions they might have anticipated or maybe they might have resisted to in the past. So I'm hoping that these examples will help people remember the, this, these principles. I'm going to serve you a little bit more. <laughs> Excellent. Bordeaux, but I want to also ask... More uh, data. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask, where do people need to go next if they want to find out more about your work and also maybe some of the tools you have out there for you them? Know, I suggest that people check out this prediction page, which you can search for Ian Ayers and uh, predictions. And I have 30 or 40 widgets where people can uh, actually crunch numbers to find out a more accurate due date if they're pregnant or they can... 
uh, predict their lifespan or their probability of divorcing or uh, who will win the Super Bowl. That's great. And we're going to put down the uh, URL as people are watching this video. Okay. Ian, thank you very much for your time. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.